What is up? Welcome to another edition of the Fantasy Life Podcast. I am Marcus Grant, joined by Dwayne McFarlane. And Dwayne, you're back out of the bunker, having spent all your time doing the utilization report, which, by the way, you can check out now live at FantasyLife.com. We have hit the halfway point of the season. We have plenty of data points. Uh, How are we feeling about what we've learned and and how do we feel about what this means for the next nine weeks or so? (laughs) Like for the next five minutes, like how does it make (laughs) us feel? Um, You know, sometimes that's how we feel in this industry. But uh, no, man, things are good. I mean, we're sitting here talking football. Um, There is quite a bit like to cover. Got a lot of cool stuff um, today, but it's, um, you know, it's one of those scenarios where some of these changes we're dealing with now um, we don't know for sure, like if, and this is always the case, right? We don't always know if something is going to last, but there's like a lot of little nuances going on with certain things. I mean, we'll talk about them as we go, but some of them it's like, Hey, this looks really good. So like, if these three things happen, it could continue, but if not, like, it's going to be, you know, it could just be back to the way that it was like, so those are always interesting. So basically like, uh, think of an example as like the Ravens backfield. Like it's like that every week. It's like, hey, Kenyon Drake, he was an RB one this week. Next week, if Gus Edwards is out, J.K. Dobbins doesn't play. Just you know, you list like all the things like that have to happen <laughs> for Kenyon Drake to again like have you know uh, an RB one finish. So there's some situations that are like that that are always fun. And when I get to them, when I'm writing, I'm always. I always love what I'm doing, but I will be honest. When I get to those specific teams, I'm like, oh, I got to write this part again. Like of <laughs> all these, if then it's like, you need a, you know, it's like you need a flow chart, right? You know, if this happens, then this, if this happens, then this, it's like, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. You need something like that for the Ravens backfield. I was going to say, you talked about it. I, I thought about all those if then statements that, you know, like would plague me in like high school math or on the SAT or something like that. Like if this, then that, you know, sort of like dealing with a, a automated phone tree for a little while. Ugh. Well, well. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought maybe there for a second you might break into it's like this and like that. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, that's Dr. true. Huh? We get to a know, little Dr. Dre, right? right? That that you actually know? that actually is a lot. That's a lot cooler. That's if a lot then. Cooler. That's a much cooler <laughs> if then than dealing with, you know, if Jonathan, if J.K. Dobbins is out, what to do about Kenyon Drake? Absolutely. It's, it is Yeah, um, especially like a, a nerdy utilization voice. Stuff. Um, if it's like this and like that and, uh, you know, honestly, um, <laughs> that that might kill on TikTok. I'm trying to like, you know, dip my toe back into the TikTok world. Something like that might actually kill over there uh, on, it. that, it's on that weird little app. We have plenty to talk about. We will dive into the utilization report, talk about some guys who are getting upgrades, maybe some sell highs, buy lows, et cetera, et cetera. We'll also talk about some new faces in new places. We, we talked a little bit about the trades last week and what that could mean. Now we have seen a lot of these guys in action, and so we have one data point there, and we'll try to extrapolate what that means. But I want to start with some situations that are, at least on the surface, unequivocally bad. And the first one is Green Bay. The Packers offense has been pretty frustrating all year long. But, Dwayne, I came into this past week saying they're playing the Lions. This matchup on paper is as good as you can get. Let's let's give it another shot for guys like, you know, well, Aaron Jones has been okay for the most part, but let's give it another shot for guys like Aaron Rodgers. Let's try some of these pass catchers. And if it doesn't happen this week, you know, who knows when it's going to happen? It didn't happen. The Packers scored a grand total of nine points. Aaron Rodgers threw three interceptions. Uh, you know, Aaron Jones left the game banged up. Romeo, Romeo Dobbs is hurt. So many things went sideways for Green Bay. Are we officially done with them now? Can we can we just put our Packers to the side and not worry about it? Or are there reasons to believe maybe there's a chance at some point down the road? Yeah, I mean, we if we want to try to find the silver linings, I think we can. We can say, well, two of those interceptions were right at the goal line. So at least they were in position to score points, Marcus. <laughs> like, that's a positive. We haven't always seen that from Green Bay this year. Uh, the other interception was in the red zone. So... Yeah, I mean, all, all three of those plays could have ended up being touchdowns. I think the positive I saw was really just Alan Lazard. And he's a player that, you know, I, I was not high on this offseason. People know. Like, I looked at him really as being, you know, he's probably a wide receiver four. If you get wide receiver three production, you're fine. And that's kind of been really what he is. Like, I mean, if you look at him, like his target share is only 17%. It's 20% on targets per route run. That kind of cuts through. He's missed some plays here and there, missed a game with injury, two games. You know, he had a game he missed early in the season, and then he battled through a shoulder injury, you know, this past week to play. But what I was noticing with him, now that it's kind of dwindling down to only him, like Aaron Rodgers definitely trusts him. 
Like he throws the ball to him when he's covered. Like he doesn't care. Like you'll notice like there's a lot of those back shoulder kind of throws, things like that, that we used to see with Jordy Nelson, used to see that with Devontae Adams as well. So while he may not be the route runner, like as those two players and maybe not quite as explosive, it really does seem to me that like Rogers is like, okay, like we're, I'm just, as long as there's not two people defending you, like I'm throwing it to you. It doesn't really matter if you're open. He had a 26% target share last week. You know, he was the wide receiver nine on the week. Um, and then the two games before that, he was wide receiver 32 and wide receiver 13. So to me, he is a high end wide receiver three, can give you some wide receiver two production. But then outside of that, I think it is tough. Um, you know, AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones is so interesting. You know, we finally put our chip on Jones. We're like, okay, three weeks we've seen this. Aaron Jones is leading the way in the rushing attempts early in the season. You know, he had been like 40%, you know, and then he was up to 59% over the last three games. He's playing way better than AJ Dillon. So it's like, okay, like they made a switch this last week, even before Aaron Jones was hurt, it was pretty much an even split between him and AJ Dillon and AJ Dillon still wasn't playing good. So it's like some of these things with these coaches, you know, it's just maddening. We, we think we have a trend, but we really don't. So it's it's tough. It's tough with their backfield. Obviously, if you have Aaron Jones, you're playing him. You just don't know if you're getting the low-end RB1 version or if you're getting a low-end RB2 version. You're getting something. You're getting something <laughs> in there. Now, of course, he has to play. He left the game, you know, in the walking boot. It, it's, I'm all, what are your thoughts here, Marcus? I'm always, always skeptical when I hear a coach come out after a game and a player's been knocked out, like in the third quarter, in a game they're trying to win and cannot come back in and leaves the game in a boot, and the first thing I hear from the coach is, yeah, they're going to be ready to play. I don't believe that. I don't think Aaron Jones is going to be ready to play. I know that's what we're hearing, so my guess is we're getting a full load A.J. Dillon this weekend, so I would be in on that. I think if you get A.J. Dillon for 70% of the work, Kyron Williams sprinkled in, that like we're, we're going to be buying on that. Yeah, I just, I do worry about that. I know that was the thing, right? That the x-rays came back clean and and they say he's going to practice this week. And, and I'll definitely keep an eye on that. Yeah. But it's one of those things where if you have Aaron Jones, like you mentioned, it's hard to put him on the bench just because of what, what he means to this offense and what he can do. But it is, it's a little bit concerning. And it's, it's concerning... Uh, even to, to try and lean on A.J. Dillon, when we saw him last week get some carries near the goal line and get stood up on a couple of occasions, I mean, you figure this is this was Quadzilla, right? I mean, this was the guy who was part of the quad squad. He's supposed to be able to power in from the one, and it didn't happen. So th this offense is just, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. And you, you talk about Alan Lazard. I know we were sort of trying to find that guy that Rodgers would lean on. Who's that guy that, that Aaron Rodgers trusts and Lazard sort of looks like that guy. I guess that's sort of the positive there. But because everything else around it has been so bad, it's it's hard to really get excited about that situation. But I guess it means, you know, I don't see well, Romeo Dobbs looks like he's going to be out for a few weeks with a high ankle sprain. I guess it sort of makes it easy. We're not really picking and choosing between pass catchers. But even then, the end result is is less than exciting in, in Green Bay. It's even worse, maybe, in Indianapolis. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Frank Reich made the change at quarterback going from Matt Ryan to Sam Ellinger. This is behind an offensive line that is not what it was a couple of years ago in Indianapolis. The Colts offense has been pretty pitiful recently. Now, Reich gets let go. They hire Jeff Saturday, who's never coached be, uh, above the high school level. And then on Tuesday morning, we get word that Parks Frazier, the assistant quarterback's coach, is going to be the guy who's going to be calling the plays, and he has never held that role pretty much at any level there. I mean, this, Dwayne, it wasn't that long ago. We were excited about, you know, we like Michael Pittman. We were excited about Alec Pierce. We were even talking up Paris Campbell as a guy maybe to snag off the waiver wires and maybe plug into a lineup into the right situation. That has all fallen apart. How many guys in this offense do you feel confident in starting now? None. And, you know, like looking at the assistant coach, like Parks Frazier, like who knows, he might be brilliant. But when you have Sam Ellinger playing quarterback, like I think, you know, and, and again, Ellinger's a young player. Like maybe we see him take steps forward, but over the first two games, he has 300 yards, not, not 300 yards in each game. He has 300 <laughs> yards passing total, you know, so 304 to be exact, zero passing touchdowns and one pick. So 
I don't know how you overcome, you know, that sort of scenario, <laughs> you know, I mean, they need Jonathan Taylor back. They need their offensive line to play better. Um, there's just so many things going wrong right now. And it is interesting because historically, like the challenge for the Colts has been that they don't have the other weapons to get the ball to, <laughs> you know, it's been like, okay, great. They got the running game. They got the offensive line, but uh, they don't have any receivers. Now it's the, it's the complete opposite. The receivers have all shown enough, I think, to be a competent receiving core. And we just don't have a quarterback, don't have the offensive line. Um, the, the How quickly this offensive line has deteriorated, like, is pretty, you know, that's pretty crazy. This used to be one of the best run blocking units in the league. Now it's one of the worst per PFF um, run blocking grades. So I don't know, man. I don't know how you fix this. To be honest, I feel the only way you create a fantasy viable situation is to have Matt Ryan back under center. As bad as that was, it at least meant you knew you had the quarterback out there that could pretty much run whichever offense you wanted. Now, whether or not he was going to play well was still totally up in the air. Like Matt Ryan would have a good game, have a bad game. But I mean, if it just depends on what you think with Ellinger, my guess is they're just tanking, you know? I mean, it's just like, Hey, let's just move on. Let's try to get the first pick in the draft, which means you just start this guy all year. But if that's the case, I downgraded all of those players in the utilization this, in, in the utilization report this week, Marcus. So I don't have a lot of confidence. If Ellinger remains the quarterback, like I moved Michael Pittman to low end wide receiver mm -hmm. three, like another week of this, like he's wide receiver four. It's like, he can't even be in your, and that's terrible. Like you had a guy that you're after the first few weeks, like, man, I may have a top 12 wide receiver, right. you know, <laughs> top 16 for sure. And then now you're looking at a guy you can't even start. And that, and that's, you know, PJ Walker comes in and makes DJ more viable. Well, for a week, Sam Ellinger has not been able to do that. So it's just sometimes we just don't know how these situations are going to turn out. This one's not been good. Yeah, this is definitely a case of life comes at you fast because I'm with you. I came into the year thinking Michael Pittman has the potential to be a wide receiver one with this offense. I did not expect that Matt Ryan was going to be as bad as he was. And look, selfishly, I look at the Colts and I say, hey, look, this season looks like a, a lost one for you. You're not going anywhere. For me, I, I'm with you. I'd rather have Matt Ryan play just for my own selfish purposes. Mm -hmm. I know that's not – I know the Colts don't care about our fantasy team. But yeah, just to kind of salvage some value out of out of any of these guys, I think that's what I would love to see. But I don't think it's going to happen. And, and this really does hurt because I liked Pittman a lot. It was great to see Alec Pierce and Paris Campbell sort of come to life. And really in the space of about three weeks, it has really all come apart and, and there are no easy answers here. So it, it's, I don't know, it's just one that I think you have to sort of grin and bear it. You try to, you know, you let go of some guys that are, that are not going to be viable and you try to make do with, with what's left there in Indianapolis. Let's get to the utilization report. Of course, it is available for you at fantasylife.com. Always excellent reading, so be sure to check it out. Uh, Dwayne puts in a ton of work each and every week for it. So let's start at quarterback where... Uh, my pal Adam Rank on, on NFL Fantasy Live recently, I mean, he is a diehard Bears fan, so he has understandably been excited by Justin Fields' glow up, but he's also uh, a Tua Tonga Vailoa fan, and he made the comment that the haters were just punching air watching both Justin Fields and Tua play really good football over the last couple of weeks, and it really has been a big step forward for Tonga Vailoa. I mean, they added weapons with with uh, Tyree Kill and you know to Jalen Waddle, who was already there. They've got a viable running game with Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson Jr. And I know right now he's just outside the top twelve in terms of quarterbacks, just because he's missed some games. But but Dwayne, this is the guy who looks like a legitimate. I don't know. Would you say he's a top ten quarterback going forward at this point? Yeah, I think he's a I think he's a mid-range QB1 the rest of the way. I mean, if we look at the games where he's finished, right? He's been healthy. Um he's averaging 337 yards and 2.8 passing touchdowns. I mean, in a in a in a league where we're just like hoping, praying someone can throw for 250. Like I remember <laughs> the days of like, man, 300 got to where that's no big deal. There's going to be three guys throw for 400. Not anymore. It doesn't happen. And so two of throwing for 337 and almost three touchdowns a game, man, like most fantasy managers, like they would kill for that right now. Mm -hmm. Like they absolutely would. So you need to set aside the name tag, the name play, and just look at what he's been doing. Like if you've got, you know, 
you've got a, you know, a position towards Tua and it might be correct. Like the guy's still making some throws that you're like, man, you put that out there a little bit further. You're having a 500 yard game. So it's not that he's been perfect, but he's been good to your point. I agree with Adam rank. I think he has been an improved player. I would say though, he's really playing like, um, you know, he's a point guard. He's the old school point guard in the NBA, not the new ones that score 50 points. Um, <laughs> talking old point guards that would, you know, facilitate, just set everything up, get everybody in the right looks. But I think, when you look at the way that the Dolphins play offense, like they've just, it's all come together together perfectly. Like you've got the right mix of players and then you've got the scheme, you know, with Mike McDaniel. So, I mean, if you look at the Dolphins, number one, they're pass first. So even though Mike McDaniel historically comes from a, from an offense with Kyle Shanahan that says you got to run the ball 50% of the time to set up play action. He said, Nope, you don't have to run the ball to set up play action. He's still using play action. He actually uses it the second most, well, actually uses it the third most in the NFL. 39% of dropbacks, they're using play action. What does that do? That creates space for the wide receivers, for Tyreek Hill, for Jalen Waddle to get in behind the linebackers, to get in front of the safeties, because they all have to fill down to try to, because if you hand it off, like they all have a gap. That's what they're coached to do. Everybody has a lane essentially that they're responsible for. And that little bit of extra space, when you give it to players like that, it's huge. The other thing that they're doing is they stay in these heavy sets. So they're using two tight ends or they're coming out with a running back and a fullback on 45% of their plays. So think about that. What does a defense have to do? You see it on TV all the time. They're like, oh, nope, got to wait. Got to let the defense sub now because the offense sub. Why are <laughs> they doing that? Because they're trying to match up with the personnel. And so when you're coming out there in this heavy set and now you're having, you know, a lot of times three linebackers on the field, two safeties on the field, um, and you only have two corners. And you got Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill running all over the damn place. You know, it's just, it's perfectly set up with the scheme and the personnel. I mean, and it's showing like Miami leads the NFL in, in pass plays of 15 plus yards or more with 66, 66 of these on the season. So I don't see it slowing down, uh, you know, as long as both of those players remain healthy. And I don't know if you got a chance to see this, but like PFF, um, Seth Galina put out an awesome video last week. If anybody hasn't seen it, you should go check it out. And if you were watching Red Zone this weekend, you saw it every play, but they've essentially got this one concept where they put, Tyreek Hill in motion, and then he's running like one of three or four routes. And then there's two other players that are running like one of three or four other routes. And it's just combinations all set up off of that. But first it starts with play action or it's an option. It's an RPO. You can hand it to Raheem Moster or to Jeff Wilson. Now Tua can keep it, or he's throwing to one of these three players and it's all on one side of the field. So the defense is like completely overloaded. They're dealing with all these mismatches because they've got this heavy personnel. They got these two jitterbugs, like just running all over the place. It's a thing of beauty. So you have to go check it out. And I saw it all the time. NFL red zone. Every time it came on this weekend, that play was happening. That's a, that definitely wanted to check out. I have not seen that. I will make any point to go find that out. But, but credit to Mike McDaniel for figuring out what personnel he has and figuring out how to make it work. It has made this offense a lot of fun to watch and incredibly productive. And for all the people who were down on Tua and, uh, and wanted to take shots at him, you know, I think it's time to sort of reevaluate because he's been very, very good, especially since he's come back uh, from the concussion issues. Speaking of being very good, Joe Mixon was incredible this past week. Five touchdowns, 55 fantasy points. I've actually talked to a couple of people who started Joe Mixon and somehow lost, which is also amazing in and of itself. But, you know, that's that's something completely different. I was looking at Mixon and looking at his schedule the rest of the way. And and I've kind of come to the conclusion that this is a guy that. I think right now you want to trade him away. This is maybe the best it's going to get because the schedule toughens up the rest of the way. You have him as a sell high this week. So I, I assume you agree, at least in, in terms of trading him away. What what are you seeing with Joe Mixon that that leads you to that conclusion? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing is just the fact that anytime you have a player have this kind of outing, like you never know what someone is thinking. Like they just see the big outing and we're, we're just human beings, right? You would think rationally, like you could look back at the rest of the year and you'd be like, man, he hadn't really been that good. He had one big game, but people, especially if they're in need of a running back, right? It, it, it's, it's a funny thing. It's funny how that works. And so that's the number one thing. So you would always want to kick the tires on something like that. Number two, you talked about the schedule that's obviously in play. And then number three, like Mixon has not been good. Like, so when we look at Joe Mixon, you know, and all the rushing, you know, like efficiency data points that we care about, that essentially we're trying to isolate the running back from the environment, right? You know, what are they able to do? What are they able to bring to the table? And, you know, you can still do well without this because the number one thing for fantasy backs is volume. And so I want to be very clear. Mixon has had the volume. 
It's been a pretty good scoring offense. The offensive line's not been good. They're 22nd in PFF run grade, so that's not really good. But Mixon, man, like if you look at his missed tackles forced per attempt, only 11%. That's 6% below the NFL average. You look at his average yards after contact on the year, and this is after this weekend. 2.44, that's a half yard under the NFL average over the last three years. And then finally, his carries of 10 plus yards or more. So we call those explosive rushes, only 8%. The NFL average is 10.5%. So he's below the league average in, in that as, as well. So I still feel like we could be seeing a running back that's really kind of hit a cliff, you know? And he had this one game, and man, I don't know how much, how much of that game you got to watch, Marcus, but you probably saw the touchdown runs, but I went back and watched all of them. And they were all gimmies. Like the first <laughs> one was from the three yard line. It was a toss to the left. No one touched Mixon until he was in the end zone. The next one, he starts off to the middle. He cuts to the outside to the right. No one touches him till the goal line. And the guy that touches him, it's a DB. Joe Mixon, you know, he may not be a special back, but like he's big, he's powerful. A DB is not stocking, stopping him at the goal line. The third one was another cutback run to the right, but it was by design. And he just outran everyone to the outside. Like they had. The Panthers had guys over there. I'm like, how's Joe Mixon outrunning all these people? <laughs> Joe Mixon is not these guys. I feel like they didn't care. And then on the fourth touchdown run, it was from 14 yards out. He starts inside. Same thing. Cuts to the outside. There's no um, contain. Nobody setting the edge. No one touches him. I mean, he's just free into the end zone. So you give Joe Mixon credit. He took what the defense gave him, right? Like a lesser back might not have read the things that were going on to be like, oh, man, I'm about to pop this outside and take it to the house. So there's a there's a talent part of the equation certainly going on. I don't want to take everything away from him, but he's not going to play the Panthers. Like if you watch carries inside the five yard line in the NFL, they do not look like what you saw this last weekend, especially inside the five where everything is condensed and defenses expect run much more. It was very, very bad on Carolina's part. So I feel like it was very much just a blip on the radar. And so I'm buying into really the eight weeks of data we had before the run blocking hasn't been good. Joe Mixon has not been good to talk, you know, add to your point, he's going to face tougher defenses now that are not going to give him those kind of looks. And the cherry on top is after scoring 55 points, he's the RB2 overall now right. in fantasy scoring. <laughs> so if somebody just looks at that, he's RB7 in points per game, which is still solid as well. I don't know about you, Marcus, like the kind of trade I would like to make with Joe Mixon, like somebody coming off, and you need the right trade partner as usual, but I would go target a manager in your league where you're trying to do a two-for-one deal. You're like, hey, I'll send you Joe Mixon you send me back <laughs> Damian Pierce, who no one knows that he has the passing down work yet. He's essentially got the same role as Joe Mixon, a little bit lesser offense, but you get him to throw in a Monroe St. Brown, right? Another mm -hmm. player we'll talk about in a minute. Get two <laughs> players like that. I feel very confident. Those two players are going to give you far more than what you're going to get out of Joe Mixon for your playoff run. What I think is going to be interesting when we get to the off season and starting next season, when we start talking about Joe Mixon is you know, how many people will look back and say, hey, man, Joe Mixon finished as the RB whatever. He was the RB6 and not point out the fact that he had one enormous game that is an incredible outlier because I feel like that is going to be sort of telling when you start to evaluate Joe Mixon. It's, you can look at the overall and say, hey, man, he had a really good year. Or you can look at it and say, yeah, he had an okay year with one huge blow-up game. And I think that's going to be a big part of the conversation around him. Uh, Antonio Gibson, just when we got to the point where we thought, hey, man, maybe it's time to say goodbye to Antonio Gibson. Brian Robinson is back. He's going to sort of take over. J.D. McKissick is still there. Suddenly, the commanders seem to have found something in Gibson. They're using him in a whole lot of different ways. He's been productive. So maybe if, if you were thinking about getting rid of, of Antonio Gibson, was it premature and and is there life for him in the last part of the season? Yeah. So with Gibson, I actually had him as a sell high last week and life comes at you fast. Like you said, Marcus. So, <laughs> but I'm not one, like I, I am very methodical about how I go about moving players up and down the ranks. Like sometimes though, there's a reason to make a very quick adjustment. And I wanted to do it with Antonio Gibson. We also have a lot of fantasy managers. Like this is their last week to make trades. Right. So with some players, you just kind of have to be like, OK, like if I'm going to put my chips on players, I want to give fantasy managers the ones that I would do it with. Gibson's definitely one. Now, his is one of those if then scenarios that we talked about earlier because they didn't have J.D. McKissick. J.D. McKissick was inactive last week. He's got a neck injury. We do not have another update this week. As of late last week, he was going to see a specialist. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we heard from the team was they were going to take it very they were going to be very cautious with him. So when you hear neck injury, like the first thing I think of, and this could be wrong, right? But you think of Chris Carson, you mm -hmm. think of some of these, like a running back 
and neck. Like, it's not good to have a neck injury as any player, but as one that, you know, has to put your head down, you know, you're going through a hole, you know, now McKissick is more of a receiver, but I just worry, you know, and what, you know, Washington's okay. Like they're hanging in there from a record standpoint. So they could want McKissick back later in the season. But I think you're just kind of at a spot where you've got to, you know, while there's uncertainty around McKissick, now's the time you have to strike with Gibson. It could end up being wrong. But to your point, even if you miss the utilization when, when McKissick's in there, it's, it's bad for Gibson, right? He's been out, he's been, you know, out kicking his coverage, if you will. He's been scoring more fantasy points than you should with the role that he has. But having said that, he's been very efficient. So he's been doing his part. He's very good at demanding targets. He has a 29% targets per route run on the season. That's second in the NFL. So, I mean, this guy is like, he's looked great. Um, and he's demanded targets in his history. Like, so 23% over the last two years, that's well above the NFL average for a running back. So this is a guy that's really good. He's already shown you he can, he can be an RB three with RB two upside. If for some reason McKissick is, is back, but man, if McKissick is gone in this last game, you saw Antonio Gibson take over 100% of the long down and distance snaps and 100% of the two minute offense that led to a 54% route participation. That's been his highest on the season. So that essentially what you're looking at in the role he has, he got, he had 39% of the rushing attempts. So you still had Brian Robinson involved, but that is essentially the Deandre Swift role from 2021. That's the Austin Eckler role from 2020 before last year, when he took over all the carries inside the five and he wasn't like a 60% rushing guy. Like he was 35, 40%, 25%. That's really what Antonio Gibson profiles. Now, like if he keeps this role from McKissick and then the last thing I would say is Brian Robinson hasn't been very good. Like he's below the NFL, all those things I said about J Joe Mixon and how he's below the average uh, for the NFL, like Brian Robinson has been that as well. And this last week, we actually saw Antonio Gibson get more of the short down and the short yardage stuff than Brian Robinson. So I think there's also a path that he just takes more work from Brian Robinson. So it's not a for sure thing, but I mean, you're down to the trade wire. And the other thing is he's not going to cost you a lot, Marcus. Like you can go buy him, you know, from someone. Nobody's going to tell you, I need a wide receiver one for Antonio Gibson. <laughs> that, that's not going to be the rebuttal you're going to get for the trade offer. You're going to be able to get him. There's going to be some risk involved with it, but there's a ton of upside if McKissick's out for the rest of the season. It's just nice to see Gibson being used in the way that we always thought he would be. I mean, we always go back to, hey, he was a wide receiver in college at Memphis. And they never used him as such. But now to see him getting these targets is a huge boost. It's why we thought he was ready to take off when we thought J.D. McKissick was going to Buffalo would open up those opportunities. And in an offense that's going to continue to probably play from behind, uh, this means there's a lot of upside for Antonio Gibson. So it's, it's nice to see him sort of come back into our fantasy lives at a point we thought maybe it was it might have been a wrap for him. I came into last week thinking Raheem Mostert was still going to have some value. Yes, the Dolphins traded for Jeff Wilson, but I thought, okay, well, Mostert's still the lead. Wilson is there to kind of give him a break every once in a while, but this is still going to be Raheem Mostert's backfield. And I guess I should, I should say I'm, I'm over-exaggerating. He, doesn't, he hasn't completely lost his value, but watching him get out-snapped by Jeff Wilson just shocked the hell out of me last week. So now I do have to really sort of reevaluate. I'm still trying to hold on to the idea that Raheem Mostert has some RB2 value, but I feel like it's a lot harder to make that case now just if Jeff Wilson is going to see an equal amount of snaps in this offense. Now are we, are, are we looking at two guys who are both usable or are they unusable because there's just not going to be enough opportunity? Yeah, I think they're probably both equal. Raheem Mostert, like he did keep the passing down work um, and they were even in rushing attempts, 41%, you know, a piece. Um, but you know, it just worked out that Jeff Wilson still had a few more targets, even though he didn't have those passing downs. Like he got some targets on the early down work that he was out there. And to your point, he did slightly out snap Mostert. I guess the thing that was the most troubling to me is like Jeff Wilson just got here <laughs> and for him to already <laughs> take half the work, I was kind of hoping, okay, let's just ease Jeff Wilson in here. You know, let's let him have 30%. But you know, Jeff Wilson, and maybe it's just a photographic memory speed reader, but I mean, there's also the fact that he really has played in this scheme. Like a lot of the run concepts are the same as what was, he was coming from San Francisco where Mike McDaniel came from. So a lot of the terminology, all that kind of stuff was probably really similar where it was different is they've changed the passing game. You know, the passing game is a little bit different and that could also be why you didn't see Jeff Wilson out there on long down a distance and two minute offense. I don't think it precludes him from being out there more in those kind of scenarios moving forward. So to answer your question, I think they're both RB threes. 
that can give you upside, you know, depending on which one. And we could have a hot hand thing, you know, it could be up. Oh, this guy's the one looking good this week and they're the one leading the way. It doesn't, I, I don't think we know enough right now to say one has a for sure role over the other, or one has this niche role over the other. Um, I think we'll need a couple more data points, but it's clear, like they're going to rotate. Um, and if I had to pick between the two, like I just had to say, I can only have one on my roster for the rest of the season. I do think I would just go ahead and lean to Jeff Wilson because again, we have to act now. Like the first data point was like, okay, wow. Like you already even things up. Like my assumption is you probably also got a good chance just to take more work away from Mostert. So if I had to choose, I would go with Jeff Wilson, but they're really close. I think they're going to be close all year because I, I, if if last week was any indication, we might be something close to a 50-50 split and both these guys are explosive. They have the potential for big plays. So I'm not completely out on Mostert. I was just shocked. I was very surprised yeah. okay, by, okay. by what I saw last week. It wasn't that long ago we were huge on Josh Jacobs. He had put together a really nice run and it looked like he was going to be the man and, and you could just cruise with Josh Jacobs at least into the fantasy playoffs and who knew beyond that. But then the last two weeks, the Raiders have been, let's just say it, they've been awful. Out of the four halves of football they've played in the last two weeks, only one of them has been good, and that was the first half against Jacksonville this past week. They still ended up losing a 17-point lead and losing the game. In the process, Josh Jacobs has gone back to being just a guy. So I guess who is the real Josh Jacobs? Is it the guy that was putting up 30 points, you know, three weeks in a row, or is it this guy who has struggled to get to 12 points in the last two weeks? You know, it's another example of where, you know, we get these trends and sometimes the trends are only usable for a short term, right? We, we established the fact that Josh Jacobs was taking over the passing down role and you got to use that for two weeks. And if you knew that it helped you in DFS, it helped you, maybe you made a trade for Josh Jacobs, but you know, just like things changed to give him that role, things have now ebbed the other way. And they've now started to give the long down and distance, um, you know, passing downs to Amir Abdullah. And then, you know, Brandon Bolden, all pro, you need him on the field for the two-minute offense. And so for the last two weeks, Jacobs hasn't touched the field uh, on obvious passing downs. And so that's that's a problem. Now, his touches are still okay because he gets everything on the ground. Like this guy gets 80% of the team's rushing attempts. So he's, he's still going to always be probably a above the 15 touch mark. So I think you're safe with that. But if they get in a trailing script, it can be problematic because the thing we had seen before is he was just getting a lot more involved in the passing game. And so over the last three weeks, like he's still been okay. Like the last two games, even though he hadn't played on passing downs, he's had three targets each game, which isn't terrible, you know, so that keeps his opportunities around 20 per game. If you add his rushing attempts and his targets. So he's still a low end RB one. He just has more volatility um, to him now. And the upside isn't quite as high. Uh, and again, they could change back at any moment. Like I don't understand the Raiders offense. I, I don't understand how it can be this bad. You have Devonte Adams, now, Darren Waller hasn't been there, so you could argue that's definitely part of it. But Josh Jacobs has been good. Hunter Renfro, I don't know what's going on. Hunter Renfro has been a good player for three years, and I don't know if it's the concussion that he suffered you know, against the Cardinals early in the season, but he is just definitely off of his game because he and Derek Carr are usually just like they are dialed in. Like they are 100% on the same page. You know, it's like a mind meld kind of situation. That has not been the case in the games, you know, as and I haven't honestly... The last couple of games, I've not been able to go back and watch like every snap of the Raiders has mostly been what I've seen on red zone. I have to pick and choose like which teams I want to go back and like right. watch the film on or plays. <laughs> right. And I haven't on the Raiders. So I, I could be missing something here, but the, the data is just, you know, it's, they're still, they're still, you know, in the top 10 and, you know, converting drives into touchdowns and scoring, but it's been, in a, it's been sliding. They had worked their way up into like the top five. And to your point, I just don't, I don't know what's going on with them for sure. You may have a take, maybe something you're seeing, maybe with Derek Carr, I don't know. But it's, uh, he's still that low-end RB1, but I think, you know, we just have to call it what it is for now until they hopefully change it again back to what it was. Which, honestly, even now, as a low-end RB1, I think that was more than anybody was anticipating from yeah. Josh Jacobs this year. I mean, he was a guy that, that people were actively avoiding in drafts. So even that low-end is, is still okay. It's just obviously a big come down from, from where he had been. As for the Raiders... I don't think the Raiders know exactly what's wrong with the Raiders. I mean, if you listen to some of Devontae Adams' quotes after that game, uh, he seems incredibly frustrated. It sounds like they went away from some things that were working. Uh, you know, obviously he wasn't going to name any names or, or point any fingers blatantly, but but just everything he said suggests that 
there really is a lot of confusion and frustration in this offense, and maybe not everybody's on the same page. And so I think it's manifested itself in that. Um, yeah, you're right. I, I don't know when Darren Waller's going to be back. It's it's sort of been just nagging injuries, keeping him out. Third and Renfro, which was a thing last year in the Raiders offense, isn't a thing this year. So it it has been kind of a head scratcher. I mean, weirdly, and I'm not the first person to say this, but but Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams, they miss each other. It's, it, it, <laughs> it was one of those breakups that probably shouldn't have been because neither one seems to be prospering all that much. Uh, without the other one so far this season. And Renfro, he even has Josh McDaniels, like the slot whisperer. Like this guy comes mm -hmm. from freaking, you know, New England, where the slot receiver stays on the field all the time. You know, they're creating this, you know, they've got them in a scheme where they get lots of looks and everything. So you would have thought that with Darren Waller out, like I would have thought you would be seeing Hunter Renfro with like these 23, 25% target shares. De Devontae Adams still leading the way. But like just for Hunter Renfro to basically be non-existent, like that just surprises me. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, a few weeks ago, I was just saying it's it's time to drop him because the upside isn't yeah. there. The the production is mid. He's not getting the, the number of catches that you would need in a PPR league to make him worthwhile. So, you know, sadly, he's had to be on the waiver wire for a while at this point. Since we're talking wide receivers, let's talk Terrace Marshall Jr., who maybe we were just a year too early on him, right? I think a lot of people, I liked him as a sleeper last year. It didn't come together. It took, one, the Panthers being bad and then shipping out guys like Christian McCaffrey and, and uh, Robbie Anderson for Terrace Marshall to come to life. But the snap share has been increased. And whether it's been P.J. Walker or Baker Mayfield last week, he's getting targets. So... Like I said, maybe we were just a year too early, but Terrace Marshall actually has some value and he's still widely available across a lot of fantasy leagues right now. Yeah, like 94% yeah. <laughs> fantasy leagues this guy's available. So anyone that's listening to this, even if you hear this after waivers run for some reason, like he's probably still going to be on your probably wire. Probably still like there. Just yeah. go pick him up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, you mentioned several of the things actually, um, you know, being on the field, number one, you know, since Robbie Anderson has left, you know, he's had route participation, uh, he's been out there for 95%, you know, of the route. So that's elite. Like that's top, top level. The best receivers in the league are like at 88, 92%. So he's obviously in good condition as well, uh, you know. Um, but the bigger thing, you know, is his ability over the last couple of weeks to actually demand some targets. He's had a 26% and a 20% target share. You also mentioned that he's done it with both PJ Walker and with um, Baker Mayfield. So he may have to do it with Sam Darnold. We'll see. <laughs> you know, this is probably <laughs> going to be a rotation. I don't think that we can necessarily pin down who the starting quarterback is going to be for the Carolina Panthers, but he has done it with both so far. So that's definitely a positive. The other thing is when you look at Carolina, like and you get down inside the five, you get inside the 10, like looking at the targets into the end zone. That was interesting to me over the last two games. He's accounted for half of the targets in the end zone. So he's a bigger bodied wide receiver. A lot of folks, you probably, if you don't remember, remember him, he was from LSU, you know, played with Justin Jefferson, played with Jamar Chase on those great teams with Joe, on the great team with Joe Burrow. And so he's a guy that, to your point, a second round pick last year came out and was okay to start the season. Wasn't really scoring you a lot of fantasy points, but you know, he was a rookie. Like he was kind of working his way in. He was the slot receiver for the Panthers, got a concussion was out for two games, came back, and they kind of changed the offense on him. He wasn't really that involved anymore. And then at the end of the year, he got a little bit of work. But it's one of those scenarios for me where, like, sometimes, like, if you've seen a full year from a player, you know, and really two years is kind of the mark where I'll cut the line on somebody and be like, okay, I'm done. Like, you're going to have to surprise me and be good. But Marshall, like, there's enough unknown with him that I would really like, he's the kind of player I like putting chips on, you know, at, at this point in the season, as far as, you know, whenever you're trying to pick up someone on waivers, because not only is he getting the playing time, he's probably locked into this role for, for the rest of the year. That's number two. And number three, like he actually is a talent profile that could have something. You don't get that combination of things that often this late in the fantasy season. So I get it. Um, you want to temper expectations. It is the Carolina Panthers offense. Just after yeah. last week, we talked about DJ, DJ Moore and surprise how we couldn't believe, but maybe it was a Geno Smith thing. You got PJ Walker unlocking potential for DJ Moore. But does DJ Moore do this last year? Crashes and burns straight back through the atmosphere. <laughs> I don't know where he's at in the depths of the ocean somewhere, <laughs> but that can happen any week. So that's the downside, you know, with Marshall. So if you're playing like eight team league, something like that, you're, you're not going to mess with him. But if you're playing in 10, 12 teamers, 14 teamers, things like that, like Terrace Marshall definitely has a place. 
I, I think he's a, he's an upside wide receiver four to me right now. And if the Panthers can somehow just stabilize their offense, it doesn't have to be good. If it can just be stabilized, if it just can be bad and not terrible, <laughs> that could be enough for Marshall. That's that's what we're, we want. We want bad, <laughs> not terrible. I will say this though: the, this week the matchup is good on paper against the Falcons, and I guess the. The upside, if there's an upside to being terrible, it's that you are in pass-heavy game scripts. I mean, I think that's that's what we saw last week when he ended up catching his touchdown from Baker Mayfield. It was, I mean, at halftime, that had turned to a boat race, so the Panthers had no choice but to throw the football, and that sort of worked out for them. But Marshall, but Marshall coming around. He could, I and mean, he might be the better. I don't like the quarterback-to-receiver um you know, narratives as much just because I've, I've studied them in the past. They don't, for some players, they hold true. They definitely hold true for like two players that have, you know, all of a sudden been elevated to starter status that practice all the time together and they have their timing down. But like, I do wonder if Marshall's not the better kind of player for Baker. Baker's really not good on timing routes, uh, precision. It's almost like if you give him that big body guy and you just let him kind of fling it over there to him, like even you notice like uh, Odell Beckham Jr., you know, a smaller, quicker receiver. It hasn't been good. DJ Moore, Moore, smaller, quicker receiver. Now, I don't know. Like you'll have to name someone that Baker's actually been good with. I can't give you one of those. <laughs> so I don't really have another. I don't really have someone to compare, you know, Terrace Marshall to. I'm just saying maybe. Maybe that can happen. I think that's part of what Devontae Adams is complaining about with the Raiders. You know, he he knows that Aaron Rodgers, like what we talked about with Lazard, will just throw it to you no matter what, covered mm-hmm. or not. Derek Carr historically is not. He's been he's more of a robotic, gonna go through my reads, go through my progressions. Oh, Devontae Adams is covered. Devontae Adams is like, bro, I'm not covered. Like throw it, <laughs> throw it this way. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with Marshall. We should. Uh, by the way, that that thing you mentioned about Carr, which I agree with that, but it's weird considering Yeah. Adams and Carr have history. I mean, you know, like he knows what Devontae Adams can do. You would think that wouldn't be the case, but you're absolutely right. That has that has definitely been the case with with the two of them this year. Uh, I'm on Ross St. Brown came out of the gates quick. I had a couple of huge games still getting plenty of targets, getting a lot of work in that Detroit passing game. Hasn't scored a touchdown since week two. And you know he's a guy that we haven't talked about recently because the games of his his production has just been sort of mediocre. But he feels like a nice, a nice ad. If you can go and, and somehow snag him in the next week or so, uh, just that consistency and knowing, at least believing, hoping the touchdowns will come back again. I, I just like having a guy. I still feel confident about having Amon Ross St. Brown on my roster. You think right now he's a buy low candidate as well. Yeah. And, and I mean, the buy low comes from what you've talked about. You know, he hasn't scored the touchdowns. So, I mean, he hasn't had a top 12 fantasy finish since week two when he put up 39.4. PPR points. But since then, you know, you had week three, he picks up the high ankle sprain. He was on his way to a good game then. He had 13.3 PPR points, but he misses week four, comes back week five, really l- limited, still dealing with the ankle injury. It was only out there for 41% of the routes, had a 30% targets per route run. So still ended up with a 20% target share when you're only out there 40% of the route. So like he was still getting his targets. Um, but wasn't able to do a lot with them. Then week seven, you know, you have the, the week six by, you're like, oh, okay, he's going to be getting healthy. Week seven, he comes back like first drive, or it might've been the second drive of the game. He's only out there 12% of the routes and he gets a head injury, which wasn't, which wasn't a concussion, but he was in concussion protocol. We don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know how all that works, but the last two weeks, 95% and 100% route participation. So he is, he, he's healthy enough to be out there all the time. They're not resting him at all. And then his target shares have been 26% and 43%. Mm. So it's coming for Amon Ross St. Brown. Like we can go back to last year when he was all they had and he was still able to pull down 30% target shares every week, even though defenses were having to account for him. He had a, and he had a crazy run, like through the first two games this year and his last six games last year, he had eight games with a 30% plus target share in a row. And then now it looks like he's getting back on track for that. Um, you know, just I kind of went back and did some re- some some history research here, Marcus, like looking at these players because I like using targets per route run in a situation like this because it kind of just cuts through. We don't have to worry about, well, he played part of this game, didn't play any of this game, he was hurt mm-hmm. this game. He just okay, fine. 31% is his targets per route run. All that mm-hmm. takes are his targets, it divides it by the number of routes he's run on the season. He ranks number two in the NFL right now. You have to have at least 175 routes to qualify. He's behind only Tyreek Hill. Wow. Tyreek Hill's at 34%. Here are the other players he's in the same zip code as. Cooper Cup, 29%. Stefan Diggs, 27%. He's ahead of both of those guys. Hmm. And so 
I'm very bullish on Amon Ra. This is a guy that we've seen do it, you know, do it in the past. We saw him do it early this season. Also, high ankle sprains are not easy, man. This guy came back pretty early from it. He's probably just now getting to where he's feeling okay. And so if going back to 2010, if you take his his target rate that he has, and I, I even made it lower because 31% is like an insane number. I said, okay, what if you've been over 28%? And right now this year, his yards per route run, same thing, just dividing yards by routes, 2.16 is more of an efficiency stat. He's 10th in the league. So I said, okay, if you're over two in yards per route run, over 28%, and targets per route run, back to 2010, what did that mean? That equals 20 points per game on average. And on average, those players finished as the wide receiver five. So I feel like absolutely you go after Sun God right now. He is wide receiver 26 on the season, wide receiver 17. This is PPR, wide receiver 17 on a per game basis. But even if somebody really loves Sun God, like they, he has not rewarded them enough in a long time that I think, you know, there's a chance that you can get them to move him. And you're probably picking up a receiver that's set to just absolutely blow up. That can give you kind of maybe a finish like what he did last year where he was just getting hmm. wide receiver three, wide receiver three, wide receiver three. <laughs> like he was in the top three, like every damn week last year. So I think he has that kind of upside again, um, based on the data that we're seeing. I mean, the, the end of the season, I think the only guy that was better was Cooper Cup. I mean, that's how yes. good he was at the end of the year. And if for whatever reason you are in that very dwindling minority of people who thinks that he succeeded mostly because nobody was around, well, Jay Hawkinson is gone and DeAndre Swift is less than 100%. So we're sort of back to the same situation again with <laughs> yeah, him in we Detroit. Are. We really are. Uh, you got Isaiah McKenzie as an upgrade. Is that because Gabe Davis has just been inconsistent or, or what, what's your, your thinking behind that? Um, again, like as we get towards like the trade deadline, you know, and, and people trying to they're in crunch time, I get a little more aggressive with some of these changes. I only have one data point suggesting this, um, you know, for McKenzie, but all the way back to the beginning of the season, really the, the, the slot role has been a pretty even rotation with McKenzie slightly in the lead. This last weekend, we actually saw him get up to 70% route participation. It was his highest of the season with Khalil Shakir going down. He was only at 19%. The other thing is the Bills are notor notorious for using three and wide receiver sets. So there's just a lot of opportunity. If you're the lead slot receiver, you're going to be out there maybe as for as many routes as a normal starting receiver on the outside, right? In a two wide receiver set on some teams that don't throw the ball as much. So you got a pass heavy offense. They like to use the three and four wide receiver sets. And you have this last factor of McKenzie now seeing his season high and target, uh, I'm sorry, not target rate, but in his uh, routes run. So he's been, he was freed up, you know, on the waiver wire over the last couple of weeks. That's the other reason he's available right now in 61% of Yahoo leagues. Like that number was a, a lot lower earlier in the season. But the last point is also what you said, like none of the other receivers have really stepped up and done much. Like if we look at targets per route run, because Gabe Davis has been in and out of the lineup, he's at 13% on the season. Isaiah McKenzie's at 17%. He's actually ahead of Gabe Davis. Now he doesn't get those deep target. Dave Davis comes through on the big plays, right? Mm -hmm. Dawson Knox is only at 12%. So really behind Stefan Diggs, who's, who's an alpha. We just talked about him a minute ago with the Monroe St. Brown. He's at 27% targets per route run, like behind Diggs, it's kind of wide open. So all the factors we talked about, plus, you know, what you brought up with the competition, all those things mean, man, I wouldn't mind taking a flyer on McKenzie. Just get him on my roster because we saw historically like Cole Beasley would come through with a lot of wide receiver three finishes, and then he'd give you a wide receiver two finish and occasional wide receiver one. And I think that could happen for McKenzie. Of course, all bets are off if we don't hear positive news on Josh Allen. You know, we've got the UCL injury. Um, you know, I, we don't have an update officially on it. You know, all we can do is go off of like fantasy Twitter, you know, our, you know, the, the good docs that all give us, you know, their thoughts, which I'm so thankful for because we used to you didn't have this information. Now you right. may not agree with every one of them says, I don't know. Cause I'm not a doctor. So I just try to read what everyone says. Like I try to find like consensus, you know, is there kind of consensus? Is there a mm -hmm. consensus thing here where people are thinking this many weeks, but if it's a strain, I mean, it looks like it would be two to two to six weeks. If it's a terror, Josh Allen would be out for the season. Like if that happened, like McKenzie, then you're just not probably not messing with it. Cause you're going to have case Keenum at quarterback. 
Yeah, that and I again, we're all sort of on pins and needles waiting to hear the update about about Josh Allen. Certainly, at last check, we were still sort of waiting. So that that definitely impacts everybody uh, in that Buffalo offense. Uh, even to some degree, Stefan Diggs, maybe not as much, but but everybody takes a hit. Uh, one tight end to to jump into Dalton Schultz. Who? Uh, oh, I, I, anything else though? I know. I think you said one one other thing I, I, about the Bills. No, on Buffalo, you, you know, you and I last week we talked about Deshaun Watson. If I am the Josh Allen manager right now, mm. waiting on this information, uh, Deshaun Watson is still available. Um, right now, seventy two percent of Yahoo leagues, he's there. Wow. There's no one else on your waiver wire that could come close to replacing. Josh Allen, if you lose him now, you're going to have to wait until week 13 on Deshaun Watson, but I would absolutely make him a priority if you can, um, if you can make a cut again, like how you feel personally about Deshaun Watson, if that's not something you want to do, then we're co- totally good. Then, with then, yeah, then, then fine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but if you're just looking at the fantasy points, it is a quarterback that has, you know, top six upside, you know, he's averaged 25, 21.7, 22 and 23.8 points per, per game over his first four seasons. So you're not getting all of Josh Allen back, but like, think about who's on the waiver wire. Like we've kind of, everybody scooped up Justin Fields at this point. Like we talked right. about him two and three weeks ago. So I kind of feel like Watson's it, man. And if you've got a Josh Allen team, I would consider grabbing Watson until you know for sure what's going on with Allen. Probably, probably smart advice. Cause you're right. There's nobody else out there that's going to give you anything close to that, that level of production. Uh, one tight end Dalton Schultz, a buy low. I know it's been a frustrating year for him. Injury wise has been a frustrating year for Dalton Schultz managers, but the last time we saw him, it was probably his best game of the season. That feels encouraging enough to believe that maybe there's uh, better things coming for Dalton Schultz. Yeah. And you know, you, you, you kind of hit on all the main things again, like it's the injury he's been dealing with the MCL and it's like, as soon as, and I watch all the Cowboy games, I'm a Cowboy fan. So like, I always, even if I miss them, I make sure to go back and watch all of them. And, uh, like he has taken some of the worst hits on that knee, like Mm. after it's been injured, like landing weirdly getting hyper extended. You're just like, Oh my God. You're like, how's he still playing? (laughs) I don't know how he's still playing but he is starting to warm up. He still hasn't hit that 70% route participation, which is like what we want to get him to. Ultimately, he's a guy that could be 80%, um, but he hasn't cleared 65% in the last three games, but he is heating up. Like So if you look at him, um, 31% and 33% targets per route run in the last two games with Dak Prescott. So I think he's a mid-range tight end one. You get the bye week, really good timing. We're gonna see, This is going to be the, the healthiest that he's been all season. So if you can make a move, but your deadline's probably here anyway, but you got to go make it right now. If you're going to try to get Dalton Schultz, he's available in a few leagues. Like he's rostered 73% of the time. So if you're in a shallow league and Schultz is there, just go grab him. But I think he's a name that we could be mentioning Marcus. Um, Once you get past, you know, Mark Andrews, Travis Kelsey, maybe that's it. And maybe you're throwing (laughs) in Kittle and Goddard. The next name could be Dalton Schultz. Like that could that's that could be the next name. Like once we look at the we you know we reflect black we reflect back at the end of this year. And we're like wow. Like over the last six games, Dalton Schultz was the tight end four, was the tight end five. So now's the time to get him if you can. Which he was a guy that that people really liked, thought could be a tight end one. And, and as you mentioned, the nagging injuries have just sort of hampered a lot of that. But we'll see what the, what there is to to say about Dalton Schultz as we get to the end of the season. Still plenty to say about the utilization report. We can't even get to all of it. So go check it out at fantasylife.com. But as we finish up the show, trades galore last week. We sort of talked about what the potential impact could be for some of these. Now we actually have a data point with some of these guys with their new team. So wanted to talk about a, a few of them. Since we're talking tight ends, let's talk TJ Hawkinson, who went from Detroit to Minnesota. I thought maybe they would sort of ease him into it. That wasn't the case. I mean, they just threw him into the deep end, and he ended up having a pretty good game. I know we both thought that over the long term, the value doesn't really change a whole lot. He's going to be who he's going to be. But, uh, Dwayne, were you surprised at how quickly they just they, they let him kind of have free reign and let him do his thing in that offense? Because it, it looked pretty good after one week. Yeah, I think it says quite a bit about Hawkinson. Um, to be able to come in and pick up all that stuff. I I thought maybe we would just see him out there, you know, for a good amount of like passing plays when they knew they really needed three solid options, like give him a package, right? And say, hey, when we're in third and four, you're playing. You're going to be out there for the passing down. But they didn't. He was out there for 84% of the routes. 
He had a 27% target share on the day, only behind Justin Jefferson, who had a 29% target share. Um, so yeah, I think it's a very positive thing. You know, at 16 PPR points, uh, you know, 36%. This this was also interesting to me. First game there, 36% of the time when Kirk Cousins was faced with a third or fourth down, he threw the ball to TJ Hawkinson. So mm-hmm. they've already somehow managed to establish a little bit of mojo between them. So I think that's all positive. Um, yeah, I think the outlook is still pretty similar to, to to Detroit. Maybe a slide upgrade because we know at heart Detroit wants to be more of a run balance team. At heart, the Vikings have already shown us they are a past first team. So that that could lead to a little bit more just by the nature of having a little bit more of a, a you know a pass heavy approach. But I think he's in that mid range you know tight end one mix. We thought we might have to wait a couple of weeks before he would be back to that. Like kind of like okay, treat him as a high end tight end two with upside. No, like we're already past that. You can just treat him immediately like a mid range tight end one and have him back in your lineups. It's it's funny because I know Kirk Cousins after the trade happened said, oh no, I've I watched T.J. Hawkinson tape. I like him. He's like I I've watched this tape going back to Iowa. And sometimes you hear players say that and you think, well, they're just talking. They're just trying to you yeah. know compliment a new teammate, but. Look, if if what we saw is an indication, maybe Kirk Cousins really was watching <laughs> Iowa game tape and seeing what TJ Hawkinson can do. Who knows? Uh, Chase Claypool goes from the Steelers to the Bears in a little bit of a different situation where he didn't play quite as many snaps. I think just 25 snaps for him. But in those 25 snaps, still saw six targets. And this is a Bears team that is hungry for any kind of pass catchers, even though they already run first team. Um your thoughts on, on Claypool after seeing him with one game in Chicago. Yeah. So he had more of the package, I think, than what we thought we would see for Hawkinson, right? It was like, we're going to give you this, this certain amount of plays. It's going to be for these certain circumstances where we would like to have someone else, you know, to create a certain kind of route route combination against this defense, whatever the case may be. But he was only out there 40% of the routes, but not, not, not terrible considering it's his first game, but you mentioned it, the six targets. So he had a 22% target share, despite only being out there 40% of the time. Now, a lot of it was probably designed. Like, it's like, hey, we know this is going to Claypool. We're putting him on the field to get the ball to him. He ran 16 routes. He was targeted on 16 of those. Um, So his targets per route run was really great at 38%. But again, just another player that we have seen historically, uh, you know, as a rookie, he was good. Second year, not quite as good, but not not bad. He had some rough moments, you know, in the public eye, like on, you know, on some island games that made him look bad, made fans get mad at him, you know, but ultimately, like his underlying data didn't fall off a cliff in year two. It was still it was still good. And so he's only having to deal with really Darnell Mooney. We did see Cole Met get going a little bit, but I would expect Claypool to take over the number two wide receiver role. Like we've really just seen a rotation for the bears all year. It's been like Dante Pettis out there part of the time. Uh, Equinamia St. Brown, you know, has been out there, you know, you can't stop those St. Brown brothers. Uh, you know, he was out there, you know, we've seen uh, Nikhil Harry here over the, like, this is like, you know, the who's who of guys drafted, you know, four or five years ago that we thought might be good and they weren't, but the bears picked them all up this year and put them all on their roster. So I do think Claypool will probably be, uh, you know, in an, a near every down kind of capacity along with Darnell Mooney moving forward. And the thing with the bears, they're not throwing it a lot. So they're not getting a ton of passing yards, but man, teams just have to respect Justin Fields on the ground so much, you know, you're going to get a couple of these efficiency games where Fields is just going to pop off because they're so consumed by stopping the run against the bears that you're just, if you remember back in the day, like when Marquise Brown first got to the Ravens, and Lamar Jackson was going nuts. And then all of a sudden you're like, man, Marquise Brown, like he ran, they only threw the ball X number of times. He ran like 20 routes. How in the heck did he catch four balls for a hundred yards and two touchdowns? <laughs> like, I think you're going to have some of those games happen. Um, you know, and so Claypool uh, and Mooney as well, they're, they'll have a chance to get in on that as teams, you know, really try to tighten down on Justin Fields in the run game. Yeah, I, I, I just I kept coming to the fact that leaving Pittsburgh means there's probably less target competition, yeah. but also fewer targets. But maybe maybe it's more efficient, especially with Justin Fields playing so much better. It gives you a little more confidence about what Claypool can be. Uh, last one here and maybe the most intriguing one, because everybody wanted to see what Andy Reid was going to do with Kadarius Tony. He was you know, telling us that he's healthy now. He was putting out cryptic tweets uh, about his time in New York, presumably. And very first play of the game against Tennessee, a target to Kadarius Tony. I thought about you. I thought about Michael F. Floria, who are the two biggest Kadarius Tony uh, stands that I know right now. 
wasn't much the rest of the game. Played just seven snaps, had one other target, ends up with 12 receiving yards. So I don't know how much there is to glean about it, but certainly the excitement level was elevated to see Kadarius Tony in this offense. But any any big takeaways about what you saw? Well, it was very limited what we got to see. But when you saw the route that he ran to get open, the flash was there of what Kadarius Tony is. Like his his movement skills are just on another plane from even NFL players, which are on the absolute elite plane of all planes. And so, yeah, I, I think the upside is still there. You're going to have to be patient. Like the disappointing part is you're only out there 9% of the routes. And he actually had, you know, because of the bye week, he had a lot more time than these other guys to get ready. You know, Sky Moore has not really shown us a lot. You know, the their rookie second round pick. Marquise Valdez Scantling, his routes are are going down. I think they're basically ready to move on from him. So you've got some you, that could open up some things for Tony. But you were hoping for something more like what Claypool had, right? You're I was hoping you see him basically immediately overtake Sky Moore, right? And get 30, 40 percent. You know, Sky Moore is 25 percent, take another 10 percent away from MVS. And then you're looking at 35, 40% route participation, and you can build on that. Well, right now we're still at square one, square one. Not mm-hmm. to say it can't change in a heartbeat, um, but Nicole Hardman definitely has a package here. Like they love using him down inside the five. You know, they like motioning him across the formation. A lot of the things we talked about earlier with uh, the motion with Tyreek Hill with the Dolphins, like the Chiefs really are the inventors of that with Tyreek Hill. And they use it, they use Nicole Hardman in the same way. So it makes you wonder. You know, I mean, is it going to be harder for him to make his way up the step chart than what we thought? But ultimately, all the reasons that if you grabbed Kadarius Tony off the wire, all the reasons you did that are still there, right? It is he is probably still the best receiver on this roster if he can manage to make his way onto the field. Juju's been better, but Juju's just running option routes in the zone coverage, right? He, you don't have to be special. He's doing his thing. Don't want to take away from him. But he's not great after the catch. Like, it's just basically him and, you know, it's him and Kelsey that, that they're dividing it up with. But even Juju, like, he's not getting, like, 30% target shares, like some people think. Like, it's like 20%. Like, there's still plenty to go around. Um, so I think there's still hope that Tony can scale the wall here, right, and, and eventually find himself uh, in a role big enough. But it could just take some time. I was just hoping for a bigger stepping stool in the first game than 9%. 9% is not very encouraging. Yeah, I know a lot of folks really excited about it. I will say this. If there's a coach that can figure out how to unlock it, Andy Reid very well could be that guy. So maybe bigger and better things are coming. Um, Just a little bit of a tease is what we got from Kadarius Toney and the Chiefs last week against Tennessee. That was more than a tease. That was a whole heap and helping of goodness uh, that we just served you guys up. So hopefully you all enjoyed that. And uh, we will take a break for a little bit. We'll come back and we'll have some ranking stuff to talk about a little bit later on in the week. As uh, we're in double digit weeks, you know, Dwayne, I was I was talking to somebody and just from a mental standpoint, seeing seeing two digits in the week, uh, it sort of just changes your mentality. I don't know if it's good, bad or otherwise, but it just is a change. I don't know if you feel the same thing now that we're in week 10. I agree, because when you see week 10, most most playoff scenarios for fantasy leagues start in week 13. Mm-hmm. So it's just that trigger that you've got week 10, 11, and 12 to get into the playoffs. You've probably just got this week, maybe some leagues extend have the trade deadline through the end of the year, but most leagues I play in, week 10 is the trade deadline, so it's significant from that standpoint. Um, you're trying to make these last moment um, optimizations to your lineup so that you can have the best lineup possible entering the playoffs. So yeah, I think it is like from that aspect, like it's crunch time. Like you're wanting to get into the playoffs. You want to position yourself to play well in the playoffs. And that just means doing everything you can, you know, on the waiver wire and through trades, like in this last, you have this last flurry, right? And then you kind of have what you have um, and, and you're moving on. So especially if you're in some of these big tournaments like FFPC, where once playoffs get here, like, you know, waiver wires lock, you know, right. once you're past your league playoffs, you get into the big race for the money. So all the teams that win their league go into a pool, right. Where they're chasing, you know, a $500,000 or a million dollar prize. Like you can't make moves. So it's all now you have to make them all now. So yeah, I think it does carry and it's, it's, it's carries a lot of different um, significance, but like, that's what it triggers for me is like, I'm like, okay, it's like in crunch time, I guess for like a mom, maybe it's like nesting mode. Like you're getting, <laughs> right. I don't know. I don't know what to compare it to, but it definitely gets me hyped. 
Absolutely. Well, hopefully we can do our best to help you make whatever last minute deals you need to or get your roster ready for hopefully a very successful postseason run. So we will come back with you uh, in just a couple of days from now. That do it for this edition of the Fantasy Life podcast. For Dwayne, I am Marcus. We appreciate you listening. By the way, go check everything out at FantasyLife.com. That is the utilization report. That's all the tools to help you build a lineup. And if you haven't already, sign up for the newsletter, which uh, I know Elliot Chris very excited because uh, a lot of folks out there are checking it out. So hopefully you can join that club as well. In the meantime, enjoy the week. We'll talk to you again real soon.